Yes, so today we will discuss uh, process scheduling in our operating systems class. And uh, I will go through my slides as usual. So let's begin the action. Um, yeah, so process, so operating systems come with this uh, process manager who also has a module to schedule processes or threads because sometimes process may consist of uh, several threads in those in that case each thread is a different entity to be scheduled so this is process scheduling also thread scheduling so the same ideas apply uh, Yeah, so uh, let's go. So the process scheduler coordinates the context switches, which gives the illusion of having its own CPU to each process. So we generally have more processes than the number of CPUs we uh, have in the system. And each process needs the CPU to uh, get some services to execute its instructions. Uh, so we give this illusion to each process that it has its own CPU, but it doesn't actually. We just make this uh, context switches. So we say one process to use the CPU and then the other, so it's called context switch. We make this context switches uh, successfully and fairly to give that illusion. Um, and the idea is to keep the CPU busy, okay? So uh, we wanted to execute some process at any given time. Uh, and we also want fairness. So once a process is in the CPU, it should leave it e either voluntarily or non-voluntarily by the kernel code, by the operating system, so that uh, others can also use it. And as I told you before, threads within a process are also schedulable entities. Uh, so these algorithms you will see today are for processes and threads. Yeah, so the context switch business is described here with a visual where we have a process P0 in execution. And at this time, uh, some interrupt uh, occurred or a system call occurred, for instance, maybe it wants to, it, it is forced to wait on a resource, like there is a semaphore here or uh, something else happened, some uh, input IO is requested, etc. So something happens here, or maybe just its time has expired. So we want to kick this process out of the CPU. So it is called the first step of the context switch, where we save the current state of this process into something called process control block, so we have these PCBs per process, and these are small memory locations uh, hold in the memory space for the kernel, reserved for the kernel. So in other words, PCB is an entity in the kernel memory space, the place where the user programs cannot touch. Uh, Okay, so we save some information. What are those information? Uh, what is that information? So we are, for instance, at a given number of line of code, uh, like number 27. So we save it so that when this guy returns back, we will resume the execution from line 28. Uh, and along with that, we also save process specific informations here. Uh, so this is basically a time spent uh, for bookkeeping. It doesn't really help the progress of this P0, but it, it is mandatory for its resume. Uh, that's why this time is called an idle time, because again, it is, it is like an overhead. Uh, it's a cost incurred in an activity which doesn't directly contribute to the progress or to the outcome of the activity, okay? So once we have that um, bookkeeping done, we scheduler now uh, decides on another process called P1, 
which gets into the CPU. And again, at some point it gets out of it by saving that info. And uh, in this idle time, I also need to reload uh, the info of the next process to be executed, which is P0 in this case. So what do we say here? In context switch is important because it allows new processes run by the processor, yes. Uh, and there is an overhead, however, because while switching to the context uh, within the CPU, uh, no work is done for the process. There is some work being done for the bookkeeping, but not for the process. Another way to view at this situation is this. So I am a process executing my uh, user written code. It's a user. Uh, it's in the user space, the memory place reserved for the users, so the big part of the memory. And then some context switch needs to happen. In that case, operating system call, uh, code kicks in uh, and it gets as executed. After all, it's another process. Uh, so this uh, execution helps me uh, save the current content of that process and also helps me uh, read the content of the upcoming process, which is this B, uh, process B. Then I am in the user space again, in the context switch time, I am in the kernel space again, and so on and so forth. Context switch is kernel code. It is implemented by the kernel. It comes with your operating system. It is not something you write or you buy. Uh, but the process is any user code, like a football manager game or something like that. So let's see some examples on this context switch, actual timings and actual costs. Actually, this is rather old. old. It is based on a 2009 Ubuntu in the April, so the first release in that year. Uh, so it's a very old CPU, etc. So this is definitely improves currently, but uh, the context switch apparently costs about 10,000 cycles. So this is not equal to 10,000 instructions because one instruction takes multiple cycles, like four cycles here. So you also need to divide this by an additional of four. Uh, but still, so more or less, it will cost you like 3,000 cycles, 3,000 instructions. Uh, so you could have made 3,000 instructions within that process, but instead of it, you are doing this uh, context switch code. Okay, so this is for comparisons. Now, okay, I decide to make a context switch. So I, in other words, I need the next uh, process to be executed in the CPU, how to select it. So this is basically the main task of uh, this chapter. Uh, so the scheduler interleaves uh, processes in order to give every process the illusion uh, or pseudo parallelism. We also call it that. Uh, it is not actual parallelism because literally uh, it is not a parallelism. At any given time, there is one thing in execution, assuming I have a single CPU. Uh, but uh, due to these interleaving, uh, we have uh, every process seems to have its own separate CPU, hence the name pseudo. Okay, process scheduler selects among available processes for next execution on CPU. I have three queues. Uh, where the processes are stored, uh, job queue, ready queue, and device queue, and a process migrates uh, among various queues. So, uh, actually, the ready queue is the most important one, which is directly in touch with the CP, but uh, we will also see the other queues, like the job queue is sometimes, especially in the old uh, systems, uh, we cannot uh, pull all the processes to the memory, uh, so we, due to limitations, we can just put uh, the, 
uh, all the ones that are a we were able to handle into this job queue and then from here I we feed them to the ready queue so I, I will talk about it more later but let's first talk about this ready queue which is the most important queue anyway so because it is directly feeding the CPU okay so that's why in every system including today's systems we have this ready queue basically a process is in the running state meaning that it is in the CPU here and uh, then four different events may occur, okay? An I.O. request may come. Uh, in that case, like, I have reached a scanf line in my code. It means that I need an input from the keyboard, a device. So then this process uh, goes to the I.O. queue, uh, which is the device queue. Uh, here, uh, so if actually if that device also has to serve to other processes, so there is a specific queue for that as well. So it waits into that in that queue, IO queue or the device queue here, uh, and then basically it waits for this IO to happen. And once it gets that IO, in other words, it is it has its turn within this queue, and also the user has pressed the uh, enter and has entered its input for that process. So all those conditions hold. And now I am safely uh, escaping from this line uh, and I am back into the ready queue because now I got what I need from the input uh, IO module uh, and I am not directly in the CPU, but I am in the ready queue now, and I am waiting for the mercy of the process scheduler to put me into the CPU back. So this is one scenario. Another scenario, which is for fairness, we will see that. So this is directly related to the scheduling algorithm. So this, the first line here has nothing to do with the scheduling algorithm. It is just the instruction scanf or something. Uh, but this line, this second option, is all about the scheduler. It basically kicks you out of the CPU because your time slice has expired, like five microseconds or something. It's, uh, it is an adaptive slice, by the way, but still, there is a time limit. It gets expired, so you don't get into another queue because you don't really wait anything. You just have out of time. So you get back to the ready queue and the same scheduler who kicked you out of this CPU will put you into that CPU at a future time. The third option where you leave the CPU is about a system call called fork, which we studied and which uh, you have solved in your exam. Uh, there was a question and also we had an assignment on this. So we paid really attention to this fork business because it is uh, it, it, it's a very important system call. It makes new processes to come into your uh, computer. Without that, you will not be able to run anything in your computer. So that's why fork is super important. Anyway, so you are a process. You call the fork system call. So now, and it returns twice. Once to you and once to the newly created child process. So you are called the parent process now. Uh, and there is also a child process in the picture now. So after the fork, I have two processes again, yourself and your new child. Uh, so this is a design actually. In this picture, the child executes. Okay, so the new guy comes to the CPU directly. And the parent, it just gets back into the ready queue, okay? Because it is not in executing anymore. It has left its place to its child, like a sacrifice. Uh, but this is not mandatory. It is totally arbitrary. Sometimes parent remains executing and the child is put into the ready queue and later child is welcome into the CPU. Uh, and another situation is the fourth option where you leave the cpu is uh, you 
basically you are blocked not on an input device but maybe you have you are uh, you are, you have called your sleep system call so you, after a given amount of time in this parameter uh, you get that interrupt like wake up and that interrupt occurs so you are waking up and you are back in your ready queue or another interrupt can be from your signal from your semaphore or in your monitor you have a condition variable uh, you get blocked on that condition variable and later that condition variable uh, that condition has became available become available so it signals you so your weight is now unblocked so that interrupt has occurred uh, or with semaphore same idea you call weight on a semaphore uh, which caused you to block because of the uh, number of resources that is not sufficient currently. So later, when a resource is released, the corresponding signal function is called, and now you are that interrupt comes to you, so you are now available, so you are back in the ready queue. Okay, so this is so so far what we have seen is that CPU scheduler in the ready queue. It is also known as the short term scheduler. It selects which process should be executed next and allocates the CPU. Sometimes it is the only scheduler in a system, so this is sometimes necessary. And in modern systems, it is uh, actually necessary, uh, sufficient. Uh, and it must be really fast because you are directly interacting with the CPU. You need to feed CPU very quickly. You shouldn't waste a lot of time because CPU relies on you to make a quick decision. Uh, so then what is this long-term scheduler or the job scheduler or the job queue we have seen here for a while? So this is about selecting which processes should be brought into the ready queue. Okay, so this, in other words, uh, decides the uh, number of ready pro uh, ready queue processes and since all the processes in the ready queue are ready to be executed this is the number of tasks you can do uh, pseudo in pseudo parallel manner in other words this is the degree of your multitasking uh, so processes uh, we can tag them as an IP IO bound process or a CPU bound process. IO bound means a process spends more time doing IO than doing uh, arithmetic or other computations, like uh, a copy software, copy program, right? You make Control C, copy it, and you do Control V on a file. So you copy one file from one location to the other. So in that case, you are uh, doing more of an I.O. because you are more uh, involved with the disk uh, during those writes. The CPU bound process is more like a calculator maybe uh, because you just, for instance, try to compute factorial of X, then uh, yeah, you don't really need any input I.O. Okay, you just need to do user ALU units in your CPU. Uh, CPU burst is the time is a time period during which the process wants to continuously run in the CPU without making an IO. So this is the uh, time spent from the last IO to the next IO. So in other words, it is the continuous time without any IO. So during that time, we are all about the CPU action. Okay, we don't, we are not bothered with the IO stuff. In other words, it is the time between two consecutive IOs. IO bound processes have many short CPU bursts because I frequent the stuff for the IO, then I get the IO, okay, then I continue my CPU burst, but it will just be very short because I need another IO instantly or very quickly. So then another IO wait. So I will have many, many short CPU bursts in that IO bound business. In a CPU bound process, however, I will have 
very long bursts and they will be very few because maybe I will need an IO in the beginning, then maybe I won't even need it further. So the burst will be the whole execution uh, in the CPU then. And so what do we have on the right here? Uh, here we have what is happening. I have some CPU stuff like load, store, add store, read from file. Then an IO came, so this is the IO burst. Then some CPU action again, like increasing variables. Then comes the IO burst, then comes the CPU burst. So we are alternating between these two kinds of bursts. And as I mentioned, an example of when an IO bound program can be a copy program that reads from a file and writes to another file. And the CPU bound program can be a scientific program that is maybe computing uh, some energy function for the permutations, for many permutations. So you create permutations uh, in the background with your codes and for a given permutation you run that function, etc. So about the IO bound, so the input output is not always about keyboard input output, obviously. So here is a RAM IO bound example. It is about memory access. If your input is large and calculation is small, then you are memory bound, which is another type of uh, IO bottleneck. So memory bound, what does it mean? After all, you have a memory. It can be very big, okay, but still you uh, connect that memory to your processors or processor, if you have a single one, using a single bus link, okay? So the capacity of that bus link determines everything. If it is, even if you have a big memory, uh, your connector determines uh, the system capability, okay? And so in this example, for instance, so bus is the bottleneck in other words. Uh, so in this example, if for this little process or the part of the process, this part is totally memory bound because for each iteration, I do uh, a memory access to this array. Array is a consecutive block of memory. Uh, and I go and get the item from that memory. So I am in touch with that memory at all times. Uh, here is, however, a CPU bound example. What happens here is I just make one memory access for the initial condition of my for loop, y equal to that condition, which is obtained by talking with memory. Uh, but then uh, I don't really access the memory. If you look at the body of this for loop, you will see that uh, I am doing some uh, plus equals so some assignments, some increments, some multiplication, and I am calling another function, maybe a recursive function, whatever. So it is uh, a CPU related function again. So this is a CPU bound example, for instance, whereas the previous one was a memory bound example. Mm. So I discussed the CPU bound IO bound things, in other words, the burst times, because the burst unit will be important in our schedule decisions. So with that, I go to my uh, scheduling algorithms now. Uh, so select from among processes in the ready queue and allocate the CPU to one of them. And again, the main idea. So there, here are four, uh, uh, situations uh, where a scheduling decision needs to be made. So for like termination, yes, obviously a scheduling decision needs to be made because that process is over now. So this is a, a non-preemptive scheduling because we don't really kick anything out of the CPU. It leaves voluntarily because it is over. Similarly, case one is also like that. What is happening here? Uh, the process was running and now it gets into the waiting state. So probably it 
hit a semaphore line, so it gets blocked on a wait call here. So then you change your state to waiting and you, you don't really want to stay in the uh, CP because you have nothing to do uh, until your resource comes or your input comes in the IO case. So you leave the CPU. So the scheduler again kicks in, uh, is triggered to decide the next process. In the second and third cases, however, we have something called preemptive scheduling because the scheduler out of nowhere, it kicks, not nowhere obviously, but uh, it uh, kicks the process out of the CPU. So it is kind of non-voluntarily. It just asks the working running process to leave the CPU because what happened, a time has expired. Time given to that process is finished. So this state changes from running to ready state. I come back to the ready state because I am already ready. Uh, so I don't want to wait on a semaphore or an input. I just go back to the ready state and again wait for the scheduler. In the third case, uh, I was waiting on a, on a semaphore signal, for instance, or in the I.O. case, maybe I was waiting for a mouse click or a keyboard hit. hit. So that hit has occurred. So uh, now uh, I am in my ready state. So uh, now uh, scheduler can uh, put me to the CPU. Um, and uh, yeah, so scheduling algorithm is triggered in these cases. Uh, as we discussed. Uh, so now uh, the scheduling algorithm uh, depends on multiple criteria, like it needs to keep the CP as busy as possible, which is called the CP utilization. We want, we don't want underutilization. Uh, throughput, number of processes that complete their execution in a given time unit, so in 30 microseconds, or like third microseconds, okay, I finish seven processes, then throughput is seven. Turnaround time, amount of time to execute a particular process. In other words, it's lifetime. Okay, and maybe execution lifetime is a better name here, but anyway, it's lifetime is the turnaround time. Waiting time is a subset of lifetime. So it is like, included in the lifetime turnaround time because this time is the time you wait in the ready queue okay uh, and response time is the amount of time it takes from when a request was submitted until the first response is produced yeah so as self-explanatory response time so we want quick responses in an interactive system for instance uh, so we want that process to move from uh, waiting to ready state quickly. So this is the response happens. So you finished your waiting and then from ready to running, uh, it is about the scheduling decision. So we want max utilization, max throughput, but mean of uh, the others. And the first scheduling algorithm is first in first out or first come first served. Uh, it is extremely simple idea, run until done. So that's why it's totally unfair because uh, maybe you are, you have a big burst in the beginning. So you are very unfair to P2 and P3. They, although they just need three uh, seconds of execution, they have to wait 24. Uh, so it is unfair. Uh, but this is what it is actually in the first come first search scheduling or FIFA first in first out scheduling. In this example, the waiting time for P1 is zero. However, for P2 it is 24 and for P3 it is 27. Hence the average is these three numbers divided by three. So average waiting time is 17. Okay. Uh, again, so I want I wanted to minimize that time, but it is 17. With a different uh, permutation of order, like P2, P3, P1, 
waiting time becomes three. Okay, so it is very sensitive to the uh, order because I just rely on this arrival order, which is not a good thing because you may not get this lucky at all times, which is the case here, the unlucky case. Uh, and also the completion time, uh, which is about the turnaround time, which is the turnaround time, it is also order dependent. So in this case, I have 24 seconds needed for P1 completion, then 27, then 30, average would be 27. And that average is 3 plus 6 plus 30 over 3, 13 in the second permutation. But the throughput, so everything, so, so far waiting time and lifetime, turnaround time, we have seen that it is order dependent. But the throughput is not order dependent because given 30 seconds, you will be able to finish these three processes. Okay. So, in other words, in this case, the throughput, in all cases actually, the throughput time is the total time of the burst times because after that you are over for sure. So, give me that sum of times, which is 30 in this case, then I don't care about the input order it will take 30 seconds. So actually the scheduler cannot do something about this, right? Because no matter what it does, even if it slices the time period uh, of P1, like it chunks it into small pieces and distributes it over this uh, domain, it will still have 24 in the end. So scheduling algorithm doesn't really have any effect on the uh, throughput. So although I say, uh, maximum throughput, but actually it is kind of misleading because uh, the throughput on a CP bird system uh, is the same. Yeah, okay, this is also saying that first come first serve doesn't affect throughput. Another scheduling algorithm would be shortest club first. Uh, so run the shortest club first. Uh, so again, unfair because uh, a job may starve to death because it may never get any service if it has a, a long uh, execution burst time. Uh, and so it, it won't start because you think your system is a very active system. Uh, new stuff is coming in, new processes, another process may have forked, another process, etc. Your terminal shell process has created a grab process, for instance, or an echo process, uh, whatever. So the those new processes may all have smaller uh, estimated CP burst times, then the one with the higher will always stay in the very bottom of the queue. So it will never be put into the CPU. So we call this a starvation case where you don't get any services. Uh, so with first come first third, I don't have a starvation case because uh, here, if a new arrival comes, even if it has a low uh, burst time, it will just go to the back of the queue. So no one will starve everyone, everything will get a service. So this is the difference of this scheme from the previous scheme. Um, and by the way, as you may realize, uh, estimating the C next CP burst time, like the, what is the burst time of a given process, it's a big deal actually. Uh, so you can do some profiling based on previous executions uh, to get an approximation of this value, but still this is not a perfect, uh, perfectly accurate value. Uh, uh, however, it will, if you have that, uh, then you will definitely have the minimum waiting time because you will always make the optimal choice. Uh, so in this example, for instance, if you somehow estimate these burst times, so I will also show you a way to make that estimation later. So P4 is first executed, finishes at three. Sorry, it doesn't wait uh, at all. Uh, 
uh, yeah, so zero for P4 is the fourth index. And then P1 waits three seconds. So it waits as minimum as possible because of the preceding uh, process, which has a shorter time for sure, which is three. Then P2 waits for 16 seconds and P3 similarly waits for nine. So if you take the average seven, so you cannot make it make the average waiting time smaller than seven, okay? This is the best you can do. So it gives you the minimum waiting time. This shortest club first business. But again, it has this terrible starvation issue. Um, so that's why this is this should be avoided actually, not a good scheduler. Uh, and uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the estimation of the next CP burst. Okay, so you can make an educated guess based on the previous uh, burst. Uh, okay, so based on the previous burst, actually. So this is the uh, estimation, the predicted value of the next burst time, t, uh, tau n plus one. It depends on tau and so your previous estimation, estimation as well as the uh, actual length of that previous burst. Okay. So let's. So we will make an equal combination. Uh, so I will weight them equally with zero point five to show you the idea. Then I will change the weighting. So I have an initial guess of guess of 10 seconds so i guess that the so uh, next burst time will be 10 but it happens that uh, that time uh, was six so there was a difference so for the next estimation you take the average of these two because you take 0 0.5 of 10 5 and 0 0.5 of 6 3 5 plus 3 is 8. similarly so you take the average of these diagonals okay 12 over 2, 6 for your next estimation. <clears throat> and I am happy with 6 actually because the next burst is 6 and my estimation is 6. So I will I won't change it because average of 6, 6 is 6. Then the actual time is actually smaller, 4. So I have overestimated. So I will pull it down a little bit by taking this average, 5. Then I increase my next guess to 9 because 18 over 2 is 9, then 22 over 2 is 11, then 24 over 2 is 12, etc. So if you visualize what is going on here, uh, the bottom row of the estimations are the blue curve, is the blue curve. As you can see, it uh, simulates the actual data pretty well. Uh, so we can get that combination equal contribution from the actual uh, measurement plus the previous guess. It's a good idea. However, you are also welcome to uh, ignore the uh, recent history. So history means the actual events that has happened in history. Uh, so if you uh, omit that by putting alpha zero, then I will not use any actual time. I will always use the same tau, same estimation. Okay, so you start with an estimation and you stick with it forever. Yes, yeah, so it doesn't sound very healthy. Uh, or the opposite direction is uh, you take everything, for, you copy the previous burst. Assume that your next burst will be the same as the previous burst. So then you don't uh, look at your previous guesses okay only the so what is the uh, bad thing about it uh, the previous guesses they involve in they implicitly involve uh, previous burst times in the average you take them in consideration but by putting alpha one you effectively kill all the previous um, guesses all those accumulated averages and you just look only one step behind and you copy that value as your next estimation. So again, this doesn't sound very healthy. So it is recommended to use a combination. So why not go with 0 0.5? It is the practical choice here. 
we also have a variation of shortest glove first. It is called shortest remaining glove first. Okay, so let's compare it with shortest glove first real quick. What changed here is non-preemptive. It has became become preemptive. Why? Because in the shortest glove first version, CPU doesn't kick you out of the CPU. Uh, scheduler doesn't keep you kick you out of the CPU. You will stay there until it doesn't sleep until you uh, finish until it finishes. Uh, but in the shortest remaining job first, if a new process, for instance, come with a re smaller remaining job, then you kick the currently executing process out of the CPU. It is called preemption, non-voluntarily leaving of a process uh, yeah, from the CPU. Hence, it is called preemptive. So uh, again, the same idea on the shortest job first. Uh, I still need that estimate. Again, you can go with this uh, combined estimation we discussed. Preemptive version, because again, as I told you, I think this is repeating that while job A is running, if a new job B comes whose burst length is shorter than the remaining time of A, then B preempts A. Okay, B says that. Uh, actually, do, B doesn't say it, scheduler says it, but uh, B causes A to leave the CPU and then B starts to run. So this is what happens in this example. Uh, so what's going on here is uh, I have this arrival time. Of, so I processes will arrive in this order. Okay, so P1 executes, then after one second, it has a seven, remaining job of P1 is seven because one second has passed. So with at time one, P2 comes. The remaining burst of P2 is four because it didn't even start. So it everything P2 has, it is in the remaining part. So four is smaller than seven, right? Remember this is not eight, but seven, but still seven is bigger than four. So P2 kicks P1 out of the CPU, so P2 now comes in. Uh, and remember, P1 has a seven, I have, I owe you seven. Uh, so later, another one second has passed, so P2 remaining is three now, not four. So you will consider three versus nine, actually three is good, so keep P2 in, inside CPU. Then another second has passed, uh, like P, now the P2, Remaining time would be two. And this P4 guy has a remaining time of five. Again, two is better, so keep it with P2. And go for two additional seconds. So P2 is over now. You will not see P2 here again, ever again. Now I have already, uh, not already, P. so currently P1, P3, P4. These are the three candidates. P1 has seven. Remember, one has gone. P3 has nine. P4 has five. Obviously, I will select P4 and I will run it for five seconds. So these values, seven and nine, it will not change again because they are not uh, executing, no progress towards their completion. So that's why it is easy to handle here. And so once the P4 is over after five, I move from five to 10, so I, I am in second 10 now. So now remaining options are P17 versus P39. I will select P17, so I will go seven here again, 10 to 17, not 10 to 18. Okay, so these are important in your exam. You will also uh, deal with stuff like this. So after the 17, uh, we have, um, P1 is over, then the only thing remains is P3, and I need nine bursts, uh, and by burst time of nine microseconds or seconds or minutes, whatever, uh, it is probably microseconds, under microseconds even, but anyway, uh, 17 plus nine is 26. And in this configuration, the average waiting time would be, you have to, uh, 
so P0 weights zero. Uh, uh, sorry, not zero, be careful. P0 weights this amount of time, 10 minus one, right? Because this is the time where P0 is, P1 is waiting, nine. Uh, yeah, it just made that waiting because nothing happened before. So nine for P1. How about P2? It has, uh, so P2 didn't wait at all, right? It just, it is just welcomed, remember? P2 kicked P1 out of CP, so you have zero for P2, not one. So you will not just put these values in. Then P3, for the P3, actually I have waited quite a time uh, for P3 to execute, but it is not directly seven because uh, P3 has a right in second two, okay? So you need to get rid of these two from consideration. It will be 70 minus two. Similarly, for P, P4, it is not five because it is in the real time, the clock of the real world, it is five, but actually P4 came here in the third second. So actually it has waited from three to five, which is five minus three, two seconds. And when you get this average, you will see that on average, you have a 6.5 seconds of waiting per process, which is, uh, which is what, which is acceptable, I guess, given uh, this configuration. Yeah. Uh, priority scheduling. So yeah, we are talking about this. And uh, you can, uh prioritize 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 uh, your processes uh to make them run uh for their selection like actually uh, this stuff we have talked about the shortest job first is already prioritized right uh, where the priority is the predicted burst time so there was a priority involved here already uh, but you can prioritize any job uh, like you manually give boost points to admin jobs for instance uh, or um, yeah so yeah you can do some prioritization but then there may be the starvation problem again because the lo low prior processes may never execute because as i mentioned uh, new processes are coming all the time to the system and uh, maybe they have, been, according to your current criterion, what, whatever it is, maybe they have a higher priority based on your current uh, priority selection. Then something that has that is very old uh, may still remain there without any service, without any CPU time. So the solution here is called aging. Right. Okay. Aging, because uh, you can make some process higher priority as the time proceeds. Right. Because I want it to uh, execute. So this is a cool idea where scheduler algorithms use in general, because priority scheduling is the one in use in practice. So as time progress you increase the priority of the process. So if priority is a real number, right? It's a key in your uh, max heap because I will select the max priority first. So you will just add this T parameter to that uh, current key uh, with some meaningful weighting, of course. And there are variations of this priority scheduling some is one is called lot, lottery scheduling in which we pick a random number between one and the total number of tokens or tickets and scheduling the job holding the ticket with this number this is the idea uh, so it is good for starvation avoidance because even you have a low priority uh, you may still have that ticket which will help you come into the cpu okay so you don't change the priority maybe you don't do the aging but you rely on this ticket 
if you hold the ticket, the random ticket, uh, obviously the probability of holding it will be low for the low priority processes, but still there is some probability. So uh, it is a good thing. If you hold the ticket, then you can come in to the CPU to get executed, to get some service. Uh, hence, you avoid starvation with lottery scheduling. Okay, we have an example here anyway. So what I have here is, uh, I have pick a random number between one and total number of tickets. So I have 100 tickets apparently here. So the tickets from 0 to 30 is for process A, then 10 more tickets for B, then 60 more tickets for tickets for C. So apparently from this picture, C is the highest priority, right? Because I give more tickets to C. So because I will generate a random number between one and 100, which is the ticket number. Uh, so it is 6.10 possibility to get a number for C. One over 10 or 10 over 100 or 0 0.1 probability to get a ticket for B and 0 0.3 probability 30 over 100 uh, to get a ticket for A. Okay, so maybe I can even write it here. This probability then this will be this probability 1.1 and this has a higher probability. So from the way we look, C is the highest priority process than the A, than the B. So now let's proceed with the algorithm. What happens is I get this number 26, okay, like the lottery, lottery. It belongs to A, the second best, but okay, whatever, it is the rule. So I welcome A and some IO requests uh, is uh, coming, has come for A. So nothing else I can do. I need to leave the CPU. So I generate a random number. It is 65, which lands into C. So I welcome C. But then an IO comes for C. So IO, C leaves the CPU. Now I select another ticket from my uh, lottery. Uh, 92, it belongs to C, so C would win, but it is blocked, so I can't put it in. I reselect the, redo the lottery, I re redo the random selection. 33, which belongs to B, so B is welcome. Uh, again, it can run until it's over, or until an IO happens, or until some time slice uh until the time slice expires so it is not the business here okay uh, and they will get an io anyway in this example so in the b execution some io has happened so i need to reselect my lottery seven it's a number that belongs to the first segment so a is welcome etc uh, so again with respect to the priority business we have something called priority inversion which is a problem that may occur in the priority based scheduling algorithms uh, a high priority process is indirectly indirectly i think this is the word here preempted by a lower priority task effectively inverting the relative priorities of the two tasks an explanation that doesn't make much meaning here i forgot why i wrote this like this but anyway uh, and there is also a fun fact here so this inversion caused a problem in in mars yeah so i, I guess if we go there but let's first understand the business actually uh, so the inversion will be clear with this example hopefully so okay i have priorities high for a medium for b and low for c so assume that I begin, the system begins the execution with C, so I clicked on it first, even though it has a low priority, um, it begins because this is the one I clicked. Uh, and then thread C uh, is released, it executes immediately because I clicked on it. 
since there are no other high priority threads executing. Okay, so nothing prevents me to start this execution because A hasn't started yet. Shortly after, it acquires a resource. Okay, again, remember deadlock synchronization those days. I get a resource R. Okay, then thread A is released. So I click, double click on this process, maybe football manager game here, which should have a high priority. Uh, so then A begins, it preempts thread C uh, since it is of higher priority. Okay, so far, so logical. Then uh, B, uh, then, uh, uh, yeah, okay, so A is running. Then at some time, B wants to run, uh, but it doesn't execute because the higher process, higher priority process A is still executing and I don't expect the medium one because I already have a high one in my system. Uh, however, now the interesting part I think coming, then A attempts to acquire a lot on resource R, okay? So it waits on resource R, it calls waits uh, R for the semaphore responsible to acquiring that resource. However, the bad news is uh, thread C still owns it. Remember, I kicked C out of the CPU while it is still holding that resource R. So uh, this request of A causes B to come into the uh, CPU in, pl in place of it. So this is where the inversion happens actually. Now, uh, so the for the global big picture, B looks more important, more prior than A, because it will always get executed even if I have A in the system. So this allows thread B to execute in its place, in the place of A, which effectively violates the priority order execution of the system, resulting in what we call priority inversion. Okay, so this is the inversion. Uh, and after several context switches, like B to C, C to B, B to C, so these are the context switches here, uh, eventually C releases the lock because C also progresses. And once it does that, uh, A will get it and now it will dominate over B again. So, and priority is inverted again. So this is called priority inversion. Uh, yeah. And what, and the inheritance what about the priority inheritance is the following. C inherits the priority of A because A is a high priority process, but since C has something A needs, actually now C is in the picture. So C kind of inherits that big priority. So it is now very important because it needs to finish to enable this high order uh, to execute. That's why C, uh, C has in, inherited the priority. And C, C finishes quickly, despite the existence of another process like B, if it has, uh, and it releases the lock. So because C has inherited this inheritance uh, pr priority. And um, so I have, I am coming towards the end actually. We have also a very important, uh, scheduler called round robin a fair scheduler so actually this is the last one that's why let's not give any break and finish it and then leave forever uh, so fair scheduling uh, uh, yeah so actually the idea is cp allocation is split into the number of processes user has uh, a user running a single process would run 10 times as fast than user running 10 copies of the same process, some unnecessary information. Uh, now, actually, this is the part, a fair preemptive. So, so far, if you look at the previous slides, you will always see this unfair word here, okay? So, we have used non-preemptive versus preemptive versions, but never a fair one. So, now comes the fair scheduler, and with fairness, it must be preemptive, okay? To establish fairness, you must preempt 
someone out of the CPU. So you must kick them out of the CPU. So you, it will, you will not find a fair non-preemptive version. It will be contradictory. So we have a fair preemptive scheduler called round robin. Uh, so round robin means like you are in a, like your dining philosophers, you are in a round table and you just give the permission to the next one. So kind of similar to that idea. Uh, each process gets a small amount of CPU time called time slice or time quantum, uh, which is usually between this interval uh, and comments on this value. Like uh, if I keep this time zero, okay, then I then I do what? I actually it does it make any sense to give zero? Then no one executes. Okay, everyone will context switch forever without getting anything done. So don't give a zero value here. But if you give a very high value, like 10 minutes, then what happens is once a process comes in, it will definitely finish, right? Because it already has all the time it needs, maybe more. So then you boil down to your first come, first search scheduling tactic, uh, FCFS or FIFO, first in, first out. Right, so too large becomes first come first search. Too small, you have a lot of context switches, as I mentioned. Uh, yeah, so uh, and preemptive after the time expires, process is preempted and added to the uh, added to the end of the ready queue. Yeah, expected. And there is also this little question here: if there are n processes in the ready queue and the quantum time slice is Q, then no process waits more than this amount of time, right? Because you have N minus one in front of you and each of them will execute at most Q units. Sometimes they will execute below Q. When does this happen? When a IO request comes as an instruction. So you leave the CPU before Q or sometimes you terminate. Maybe you are in your last slice so you will not reach Q even, but in the worst case, you will always go to Q and there will be N minus one guys in front of you. So you will wait at most N, N minus one times Q units. Okay, a nice fill in the blanks question maybe for the exam again. Uh, and for the, yeah, with that idea actually, now I can uh, solve, this scheduling problem where I have these burst times given uh, for P1, I have 20, sorry, every, everyone will exit it must 20. So P1 comes in and after 20, it leaves, then P2 comes in, but after eight, it leaves. So it doesn't need 20 actually. So you will not see this purple P2 again because it is gone. Then P3 comes, let 20, on it as well, so 28 to 48. And then P4 comes and 20 of this burst is gone. So I have four remains for four. And later when the turn comes back to P4 at time, whatever, in this case is 108, I need four more seconds. So it will finish in time 112. Okay, so that will be the uh, actual word time of the finish of P2, however, P4. However, the wait time of P4 is not that. So let's only focus on the P4 wait time. It has waited 48 seconds here, and now it is not over. So it has waited another amount, which is running from 68 to 108. So in other words, a 40 seconds it has waited. So for P4, I have a wait uh, amount of 88 seconds. You do the similar calculations for P1, P2, P3, and at least four values, divide by four, and obtain your average waiting time, which is 66. Again, you should create these numbers, compute these numbers in the exam. Uh, also, completion time is also important. Uh, so for our profiling purposes, uh, for evaluation of our scheduling algorithms, we need to keep these values low, remember, uh, uh, yeah, and the completion time for that, actually, I will need to look at the last uh, time. 
real world time for the corresponding segment. So for P1, it will be 125. For P2, it finishes at 28. So very short for it. Uh, because it was also lucky to get executed in the beginning. Yeah, so for the uh, yellow, it is 153. And for the green, it is 112, 112. Then the completion time will be the average of those four numbers. And remember, in our shortest job first scheduler, uh, we have this optimality guarantee. So it is definitely it definitely minimizes the waiting time by definition. Uh, but it is also a, a something, an impractical algorithm because the burst times, the next burst times uh, is hard to come up with. We have seen an estimation method, but it relies on that. So it is not that accurate. Uh, hence, uh, we go on with this more principled algorithm instead of round robin. Yeah, so this is the same idea with uh, different view. And by the way, here I am also counting the number of context switches. So in addition to this information, again in the exam, it may be necessary for you to compute the context switches. Uh, so in this example, time quantum is what? If it is 12 and if your burst is 10, then you need zero context switches, none. But if, what's happening here? If the quantum is six, then you switch once and, yeah, once, uh, then you come back in again, but it is not asked here. Here, what I ask here is uh, the number of times you leave the CPU, which is one here. Uh, and, and what? In the bottom, if the quantum is one, then you effectively switch at every second. And we have 10 further seconds here. Yeah, so hence the, the 10. So these are the minimum number of context switches uh, because uh, here, for instance, at this time, you may make some IO. Then you have a context switch for another process. So you have another bar here, and you also have this bar due to your. Uh, Actually, it will also shift a little bit because you will start from here again. But uh, even if it shifts, you have a, you have two bars. So then the answer would be two. Uh, but it is obviously not visible here. That's why this, these are the minimum times. If there are some I/O, some waiting, then some blocking, then this uh, these numbers will increase. It is a quite fair system, no starvation, because thanks to this time slice idea, everyone will be served eventually. Uh, actually, we have seen here somewhere, right? N minus one times Q. So you also know the worst case time, uh, worst case uh, time for your next iteration. So this is fair and informative scheduler. Uh, yeah, so. Now starvation divides the CPU power evenly to the processes. Uh, we get good response times uh, and turn the lifetime is may not be optimal, but uh, we are more involved with the fairness here. And actually, in my website, I put this uh, demo written by Onur Tolga Sheitoğlu, so uh, I can go there real quick uh, uh, by changing the uh, by changing what by changing the screen sharing to my chrome application uh, yes so here if i go to my website in the operating systems okay so i put it here in the scheduling demo part so here you can select the policy like FIFO first and first start. So you have A, B, C, D, E. These are the uh, processes. Currently A is in the CPU. So I hit here as the time goes. Okay, 10, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And something now will happen. This will finish because 
There is no time slice here. I waited for A to finish, and again, I am assuming no IO here, no uh, uh, waiting state is happening here. So when I hit this, B will come, right? Because it is first in, so it will be first out. And I also have this additional Q here. It has nothing to do with the algorithm. I will just make A wait here to show that it will come back to this queue, but now it will come from the back. So it will be two, one, and now A will come to the back of this queue, right? Because it is last in now, so it will be last out. So one more second, and now when I hit this, I will welcome C here, okay? Then it sleeps with a random number here, I guess. Yeah, so the random number is now 15 for C. Yeah, so you get the deal. FIFO is easy anyway. So let's also do a round robin real quick. In the round robin, with the time slice of Q is implemented here. So one second. Uh, what happened there? Anyway, two seconds. So after two, A is left and B comes. So B will execute two more seconds, then C will come. C, one, two, C comes. And B goes to the back of this Q. So we also have this Q in round robin. Now after two seconds, C will go to sleep because it is it is finished. I will just make it sleep uh, to welcome it back later. Okay, a random amount, which is weird, 15. Then two more seconds from eight to seven, then seven to six. Then after two more of E, A will come. And sorry, what happened? D has gone uh, yeah so it is um, some priority is also considered here i guess i don't know maybe an implementation mark but you get the idea hopefully so i didn't play with that a lot so it's but it just gives you the general idea okay so now we are approaching to the end of our class a very emotional moment uh, here happening. We have also finished this. I will discuss just a little bit on uh, on the multi-level queues because all algorithms so far are using uh, a single ready queue. Okay, they all act on this ready queue. They all select their victims from that queue, not a victim, but uh, select the process from that queue and let it run. But in general and in practice, in even the current operating systems you use, we have a hierarchy of queues around. Uh, we have several queues, multiple queues, and they also need to be scheduled differently. So for instance, a general team is like this. Uh, you partition your ready queue into separate queues because uh, some of the processes may be interactive foreground processes like uh, they get input from the user, etc. So you can schedule them with round robin. Whereas some other processes are like scientific processes that don't need any user input. They just run in the background. Actually, I am also running something here in the background. Maybe you have noticed. So these are the batch processes, for instance. In uh, it doesn't. They don't really affect my. Uh, they don't need any input from me, as you have seen. I was teaching something here for a for good of one hour, and they just run. It actually it finished. That's why we won't see any yellow action. But if you come back to the beginning or some part of the video, you may see that yellow thing flowing up and down. Anyway, so I can make a different scheduling for that. Uh, and then, actually, uh, I also need to select the queue uh, to work on, okay? Sometimes serve this queue, sometimes serve the other queue, etc. Uh, yeah, for instance, if you always serve the foreground items, then the background uh, items will start to death, etc. So, uh, you need some separation. Uh, interactive foreground processes need more uh, CPU time, actually. Uh, 
because they someone is on in front of them they need some response quickly that's why we can put 80 percent of them and we can put them in a round robin so with some guarantee of response time and you can put the 20 percent uh, of the uh, non-friendly batch programs to the to a different uh, scheduling algorithm like a fifa algorithm in other words uh, i have a multiple I have multiple queues and I will schedule them differently. Again, uh, system processes are scheduled here with round robin time slice five. Interactive processes, maybe they need even more responses. So I will use round robin one with time slice two. So it will come back to that process again frequently. It will visit it. Uh, and if the input is ready, then it will continue, etc. So, so on and so forth. Uh, so once process is assigned to queue, its queue may change. Actually, normally with so far it doesn't change; it will stick there forever. But in general, again in practice, uh, you get some feedback, uh, and you migrate the process from between various queues. Okay. Uh, so for instance. How a feedback comes is aging is one option. You can, after a certain age, you can move a process to a queue, like a round robin queue, uh, to a queue which gets a round robin service with a small time slice. So it will definitely, in a small amount of time, get some uh, response then. Okay, so that is that. Uh, and we also have, uh, um, yeah, so multi-level feedback queue is defined. So what are the parameters involved here? Uh, how many queues you have uh, and scheduling algorithms for them, etc. So here is a concrete example with, to wrap up everything I said about the multi-level queue. I have three different queues here. The first one, is served with round robin with Q of eight. And the second time is uh, same scheduler, but a more burst time. So maybe I have more CP bound stuff here. Okay. Uh, so I don't need to move it a lot uh, to the outside and to the inside of the CPU. With eight, it will frequently get out of the CPU and come back hoping that some response comes, came, some input came from the user. So this is extremely user interactive program here. However, with a CPU bound problem pr program, I don't really need that much input. It will just execute like permutation of uh, iterations, blah, blah. So I can give it, I can avoid further context switches for that. I can let it run a lot of times without any interruption, without any preemption. Uh, and also you can learn this behavior by just profiling some executions. So you can maybe make several runs of the same program to tag it, because after all, you have Word program, PowerPoint program. So you are running it lots of times, right? During the course of your life uh, with that computer. So with each run, you can, operating system can uh, keep a track about that program, okay? That particular process. So when you run it again, you will uh, give that program a more friendly, a, a better slice amount here, okay? Based on its profiling, based on its behavior. So this is uh, something we can do to, for further improvements. Uh, and by the way, if you also have a non-interactive process, uh, okay, uh, like a batch program, like I run in the background, uh, you can just put them in into your Q2. So here, um, since you, as a user, you will not interact with that program, probably you will leave it here in my computer in, in the back of me. You will leave it there. Maybe you have, assume that you have three batch files, okay? It will run without any user in input, without any IO. So 
you can put them in a first FIFA queue. So, and I will come back to my office tomorrow morning. So I won't be here anyway. So it doesn't matter if I first do the batch one, then batch two, then batch three, or because even if batch one is very long, I can eventually I will, when I come back to the office, all the three will be over anyway. So I don't care about that order. That's why I don't want to uh, disturb my CPU to make it change between processes because those processes are not that time critical, right? So I will just put them into this uh, FIFO queue. They don't really play the round robin game. Okay, so this is the motivation here. Uh, yeah, and this is also giving an example in those lines. A new job enters Q0 uh, with slice eight. When it gains CPU, it receives eight milliseconds. If it doesn't finish in eight milliseconds, job is moved to the next queue maybe. So by the way, with the eight milliseconds queue uh, slice, you realize that the job isn't finishing. So maybe you have a suspicion that this is a more CPU bound process. Maybe it deserves more CPU. It will get less IO interruption. Uh, it has that behavior. So why not move it to a queue with a more continuous CPU service? In other words, uh, a more amount of time slides, which is 16 years. And Q1 job is again third in round robin with 16 additional milliseconds, uh, 16 absolute milliseconds, so with eight additional because eight plus eight is 16. Okay, so eight milliseconds. If it, if it still doesn't complete, it is preempted and moved to Q. So maybe uh, you may also put it to another queue where it doesn't, it just finishes until the end. Okay, so these are all design decisions. And finally, so these are all the scheduling algorithms I want to mention. And so far I have worked on a single CPU uh, and I feed it with these uh, processes based on the scheduling algorithm. Sometimes I have multiple processors, so multiple CPUs. So it's not a very interesting, very weird idea. It's very common. Uh, so in a uniprocessor case so far, we decide which thread of that process, for instance, should run next. In a multiprocessor, we also decide which CPU to select and then which thread will run on that CPU. So there are two architectures, asymmetric and symmetric. In the asymmetric one, there is this master processor, the single processor, which is in touch with the kernel code, okay? Which does the scheduling actually. So uh, all other processors execute the user code, not the kernel code. They are they all run the video games, etc. So the master can also run video games, the user code, uh, but it also does sometimes uses the operating system code, kernel code for the scheduling decisions. And then it decides on the next process to run on which processor. So this is not very common actually. In the common scenario, we have some symmetric multi-processing where I have two or more identical processors uh, that are in touch with a shared memory. Uh, and each processor does its own self-scheduling like with the methods we have discussed so far. Uh, and with the symmetric architecture, uh, some migration may happen. For instance, uh, uh, that scheduler in processor one wants you to run in processor two because it realizes that it is overloaded. Maybe it has a bigger queue. It also sees the queue of processor two through this shared channel, shared memory. So some memory information exchange happens. Okay, so uh, then you migrate from one processor to another, but this is not a very good thing actually because migration of a process from one processor to another is costly because of the cache data invalidation. So with every processor, there is a memory unit close to that processor, okay, physically close to it. So it is connected that processor with other connectors like other buses. Uh, so it is called the cache memory. Uh, so if we keep the process 
in that processor. So it means that I can use that fast cache all the time. But if I migrate it to another processor who has a separate cache, then I need to refill that cache with my new information. So this is a costly operation. So you should avoid migration of one process from one processor to another. You can make that avoidance by assigning a processor to a particular process and do not allowing it to migrate. Very simple and basic idea. Our operating system may try to keep a process running on the same processor as much as possible. So this can be handled with an algorithm. Uh, yeah, and the last slide is again talking about that uh, load balancing. So what uh, sometimes although I uh, although I promote migration here, okay, sometimes it is inevitable, okay, because you need to balance the loads between all those processors. After all, I have many processors. And I don't want to suffocate one of them, right? Just to avoid cache invalidation. Sometimes load balancing is necessary. So all processor to that end should keep an eye on their load with respect to the load of the other processors, okay? We have some information. And process should migrate from load to processors to the idle ones or less loaded ones. This is called push migration. The busy processor pushes out of some processes from it, like unloads, unloads its work. And pull migration is like the idle processor, idle processors grab processes from other processors. Okay, so this should have a processor, I guess. Uh, yeah, so there is this thing going back and forward again. Uh, yeah, actually with that, we finish our scheduling business um, uh, in like 90 minutes. Um, so again, this will be the topic of your upcoming final exam. And it is also an important operating system issue. So are there any questions regarding to this uh, topic? Mm. Okay, uh, I guess not. Then let's uh, stop here uh, and see you next week.